Hello, I'm Dean Carianis, and welcome to History Author Showtime. In this episode, we'll look back at 1969's classic, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, starring Paul Newman and Robert Redford. It racked up four Oscars, and was nominated for three more, so it's a good movie, but is it good history? The short answer is no, but you didn't come here for short answers, you came here for facts. This look back at the pop culture past examines what the film got right and wrong about yesterday, beyond the nitpicking you can read for yourself at places like IMDb. So pour a glass of bourbon, pop some popcorn, and find your seat. It's time to dim the house lights and fire up the projector. Not all films set in the past have to be factually accurate, down to the last spur and saddle. In fact, they can't be, because there are things we don't know, especially about Butch and Sundance, whose lives are cloaked in myths, legends, and tall tales that they often encouraged. Plus, it requires compromises to cram their rip-roaring adventures into 110 minutes. But the filmmakers of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid chose to start their film with a full-screen celluloid boast that must be debunked. Those six false words are, most of what follows is true. And they used that as a tagline in much of their promotional material. Now, we go to movies to be told what Fleetwood Mac called sweet little lies. But putting it in writing means you're making a claim to historical accuracy, to telling the story of real historical events and real people. And on that score, this movie fails. The strange truth is, screenwriter William Goldman made a point of not reading the real history of Butch and Sundance. Yet he boasted about having done years of research, eight years according to this news article. It was all part of creating a fictional experience, I guess. I just wish he hadn't put that claim so prominently at the beginning of the movie. So take everything you see on screen with a grain of salt, like all those stories we used to tell as Boy Scouts around the campfire. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. Ugh, speaking of bad movie moments. Anyway, I discussed this movie's shortcomings with historian Charles Learson in the History Author Show interview about his outstanding book, Butch Cassidy, The True Story of an American Outlaw. There was definitely a real guy, born Robert Leroy Parker, who called himself Butch Cassidy, because it was just a better name. And there was another guy, who they called the Sundance Kid. Yeah, that's my real name. Robert Leroy Parker. No fooling? No. Mine's Longbottom. No fool. Long what? Terry Longbow. You can learn more about both of them in that book, where Charles does his best to paint a true picture of their lives. Sundance is undeniably a very cool nickname, and it's one Robert Redford has adopted for his ranch and his film institute. But sorry, Sundance wasn't Butch's BFF, as is shown in the movie. Charles Learson broke down how Hollywood managed to corrupt the facts of Butch and Sundance, but somehow, against all odds, capture the spirit of those Old West gunslingers. When you're a writer of books and you write it on a subject that Hollywood has touched, you see that Hollywood has no shame about changing anything, adding people, subtracting people, you know, giving a guy a wife or erasing his wife from uh, whatever. Uh, there's no shame involved. So, But in this case, William Goldman, one of the great screenwriters of all time, did only a little research. He was, as a kid, he'd, he'd, he'd heard about Butch Cassidy and he was sort of interested in him. It was a, kind of a back burner kind of thing. And I found, I went to this, William Goldman's papers in, at Columbia University, where he went and where his papers are. And I found in the Butch Cassidy folder, like there was a comic book from the 50s and a couple of magazine articles. 
and the script that he wrote for the movie. And so that's as much kind of research as he did. Paul Newman, who played Butch Cassidy in the movie, did even less. He was just all about like getting a feel for the, I mean, he was a great actor, but he, in terms of research, that wasn't his thing and he wasn't about to do that. So between the two of them, they didn't know very much about the real Butch Cassidy. And yet, and yet, they somehow came up with a character who by accident, but by fortunate accident, is in a lot of ways resembles the real Butch Cassidy in the sense that he's charismatic, witty, charming, and interested in his surroundings and interested in the, this whole thing of society and how, how people interact with each other and fascinated with the world around him. And so in that sense, which is a very big part of the character, you know, the things that the character said and did in the movie, um, mostly all you know, complete nonsense and fiction, but the essence of the character is actually true. Somewhat less so that with Robert Redford, who played the, the Sundance Kid, the real Sundance Kid was, was very handsome, as of course Redford is, and could be charming, like Butch and Redford, but was also very, had a tendency towards moroseness and always wandered away and wanted to be by himself. He was, in a lot of ways, the opposite of Butch Cassidy. And the woman in the movie, Catherine Ross, if you remember her, beautiful actress, talented actress. She was called Etta Place. Her real name was Ethel Place, where she called herself that. Place was almost certainly not her real name. Very much a mystery to researchers and, and to me, even after four years of trying to study her, we know very little about her. But we do know from one picture that she has standing next to the Sundance Kid taken at a photo studio in, in Lower Manhattan when they were here uh, briefly, that she was very beautiful and not in a way that, you know, you always hear like women in history books are beautiful and then you see the woman, you go, what? <laughs> Say, well, you have to understand the context of the time. No, she was just beautiful. And uh, you could see it in the picture. And, and, and not only that, but a crack shot and a great horsewoman, admirable in many ways. And she went off to South America with the two of them. She never had been Butch Cassidy's girlfriend. And in fact, we can get into that. Butch's relationship with women is very... I said he was very squirrely about women, and there are Western scholars who think he may have been gay. And he was certainly a third wheel in the relationship with uh, Sundance and uh, Ethel Place. And when they went to South America, it was not a menage a trois. He lived in one part of the cabin and, and they lived in the other. By the way, and this shows you how Hollywood changes things, they up and went to South America in, in 1901 left from New York, which was why they were in New York. And William Goldman had a, had a hard time selling the studio heads on this part of his script that these guys would take off. They said, no, John Wayne never ran away. He's got to, they've got to stand and fight, you know, the, 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 the lawmen who are pursuing them. And, and William Goldman said, well, that didn't happen. I'm sorry, you know, and they said, ah, we don't care. Just, but he finally talked them into a, an abbreviated and and very much streamlined version of the, of the South American part of the story, because in reality, they went to Argentina for a while where they tried to go straight and run a cattle ranch. And the three of them li lived on that ranch and then returned to a life of crime. They were in Chile for a while and then they uh, were in Bolivia where they met their end. And so in the movie, they just go to Bolivia. Those scenes were shot, by the way, in Mexico. So <laughs> Hollywood changes everything. So there we see a, a streamlining and a, and a changing of things. You always have to be suspicious of getting your history for the movies. That's, <laughs> that was another lesson for me in this book. A good lesson indeed. Now, I'm not going to read you all those IMDb goofs and trivia and pass that off as my own research but you can find quite a few listed there along the lines of the ones Charles pointed out in Butch Cassidy. Things like power lines showing up in a shot are sometimes unavoidable when you're shooting in a modern environment. Likewise with things like the model of locomotive, button-down shirts, and at a place's clear nail polish. But the anachronistic term bingo, which you can see right here in the script, listed as a show note to flesh out the character, with something that's completely out of character, that probably could have been substituted for something that was from the period. And they had a lot of great terms back in the Gilded Age. A lot of really fun slang that I think could have been plugged in right there instead of the word bingo. The only thing that really sucks a casual viewer out of the film and screams, this is a movie, 
is the hairstyles. People just didn't wear it like that in the Gilded Age. Granted, I've spent hours researching the period and looked at thousands of pictures, but I think this stands out to anybody, and that this is probably a case of the actors just not wanting to undergo the snip-snip. At the time of this film, Paul Newman was already a legend, but Robert Redford was a newcomer, fresh off his success in Barefoot in the Park, so he probably could have been forced to change anything to get this role. But heck, if I had hair like him or Newman, I wouldn't mess with it either. No way, man. My hair is who I am. Oh, I'm a freak. So I'm giving these guys a grudging pass on the hairstyles. At least it's not like this jerk, showing up in the Korean War of the 1950s with a mustache straight out of the Times Square smut films from the 1970s. What was he thinking? You gotta be kidding. Wow. This is a dirty movie. No, no, this, this, is, the, this is a movie that uh, a lot of couples come to. All kinds of couples go here. This line is also historically incorrect for Sundance. This might be the Atlantic City, New Jersey of all Bolivia, for all you know. Look, I know a lot more about Bolivia than you know about Atlantic City, New Jersey. I can tell you that. Aha! You do, huh? I was born there. I was born in New Jersey. Brought up there. So, you're from the East? I didn't know that. The real Sundance kid was born in Montclair, Pennsylvania. That's about a 90-minute drive in your newfangled automobile from Atlantic City. That's a clear changing of the facts. I guess just because it makes the scene flow. And Jersey is funnier than the Keystone State. It sounds funny to say you're a cowboy, an Old West legend, and you grew up in the Garden State. It's also interesting to note that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid put these two outlaws back on the map, rescuing them from the mists of history despite not giving much history itself. The late great film critic Roger Ebert put it this way, quote, Butch, Newman, and Sundance, Robert Redford, were two Western outlaws, unsung until now, who led a gang of cutthroat train robbers. Of course, as we learn in Charles Lerson's book, they really weren't cutthroats, but Ebert could be forgiven for getting that impression from the film. The critic also noted the film's decidedly modern flavor, noting, Goldman has his heroes saying such quick, witty, and contemporary things that we're distracted. It's as if, in 1910, they were consciously speaking for the benefit of us clever 1969 types. Speaking of reviews, the Philadelphia Inquirer's William Collins thought that Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid was a satire. As I diligently dug through the newspaper archives to bring you this breakdown, I found numerous mentions of how people were upset by all the ultraviolence in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Complainers included President Lyndon Johnson, who at the time was directing the bloody war in Vietnam that he had ramped up into a meat grinder. But somehow, it made him feel queasy to see squib packs exploding on actors who would go home to their families that night. It's a strange piece of history, huh? And shows just how much more real what we see in fiction can be than what happens in real life. So my final ruling is, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid delivers the goods as entertainment. But if you want the real history, this is absolutely not giving you the goods. Well, it's time to get some fresh ice and refill my bourbon. Thanks for watching History Author Showtime. Now go read a book.